to Taylor English Duma I'm here in my in the room with a, quite a number of my colleagues, and we have quite another additional group on the uh, Zoom with us today. The topic today is basic preparation for deposition taking, and this would be a universal subject matter. It's not going to be limited to uh, Georgia courts or federal courts. The general idea is how can you organize yourself for effective deposition taking uh, and uh, what sort of tools that are readily available to everybody these days can be used to help get yourself both prepared to take the deposition and to strategize the deposition, but also to be able to put your fingers on necessary exhibits and such in a timely fashion during the course of a deposition. Because as we all know, sometimes you're restricted to a very limited period of time to accomplish your deposition. Uh, for those out there in the world that are maybe listening to this on the web, uh, this is just a informational session. We are not your attorneys. We are not telling you how to do things. We're not telling you that what we're saying uh, to do will work for you. Uh, so do rely on your own attorney to accomplish the tasks and litigation. And uh, also, if you're doing it yourself, seriously consider uh, getting an attorney to assist you in your litigation efforts. Uh, but this is something you could do that some of the tools we use could be very helpful to an attorney and might save you a fortune if you do it well to assist the attorney who's uh, working with you in litigation. So for those of you all here and that, that can communicate with me, know that this is an interactive session. We would obviously like <coughs> anybody with other experiences or better ideas uh, to uh, chime in and share what your thoughts are, say what's worked for you. And uh, I think I'm the only live microphone, so I'll have to probably repeat what you're saying, but uh, hopefully, therefore, everybody else can hear it. Uh, and in general, this is a best practices session. I mean, every session we do is intended to not only increase our, increase our effectiveness for our own clients, but also to learn from each other about uh, tricks of the trade that we may never have thought of before. Somebody else learned at a different law firm before they came here, and it's the best thing since sliced bread, and nobody even thought about it uh, before. Uh, or there, in this case, could be software does something that we didn't know it would do and it will solve problems for us that we didn't know we could solve. Uh, so the, the, to start with, uh, we've got this discussion of why would you take a deposition in litigation? Let's assume it's a, court, a commercial case that has a reasonable number of documents, a thousand individual documents that uh, could be emails, contracts, letters back and forth between people, uh, text messages, photographs, et cetera. Let's say they, they total a thousand documents and that the parties have exchanged the documents and hopefully they've used some sort of mechanism to track the documents that have been exchanged by putting uh, unique numbers, which in the litigation world we call Bates numbers because of historical uh, use of a machine that was literally stamp uh, a number using a mechanical device onto the document and ink. I don't know if anybody even knows what ink is anymore, uh, but uh, but nevertheless, whoever Mr. Bates was or Ms. Bates was got their name stuck on that machine and, and lawyers still call them Bates numbers. But generally speaking, that would be a number from zero to whatever that individually marks the page of the document uh, so that every document that you eventually get in litigation would have a number on it that starts the first one document you get from the other side would be 0001 and then on up from there uh, we had a case recently that had hundreds of hundreds of thousands of documents uh, and usually also there is a designation of who the uh party is that's producing the document and perhaps also for what case it's being produced so that let's say a company has a whole bunch of litigation and they want to say all right well I, I, they want to know that if they see a document that they produced it 
in a particular matter involving a particular opposing party. So it might have both the name of the producing party with some abbreviation perhaps, and then a hyphen or something, and the name uh, of the opposing party. So that they can identify that document's ever floating around anywhere. They know that's where that document came from. Now, some of these documents will be a single page. Let's say it's a photograph. Some of the documents may be, I think Mark and I had one with 670 pages in a contract. Uh, and so, you know, most of the time it's a particular clause on a particular page or pages in a contract that you're wanting to cross examine somebody with eventually down the road. So you have to be able to not only find the document itself, but also find the page in the document that you're wanting to uh, have testimony. <laughs> All right, so if you are if you're in litigation, let's say you've gotten these documents and they are labeled, uh, what would somebody want to do? What would be a goal of taking a deposition in a case? Why not just go to trial? Any input? You want to know what the witness is going to say at trial about that particular clause, that issue? You want to know what the witness would say at trial or what the witness uh, might now say about what it would say at trial? Either one. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, so that's an absolute. So if you had, especially if you had all sorts of surrounding circumstances. And it's not just having the witness, it's not a whole lot of purpose unless you're just trying to pound into somebody that they signed a contract that says just the opposite of what they uh, are now claiming it says. Uh, you wanna find the surrounding circumstances regarding the execution of the contract, how it came to be that this clause that may have missing words or whatever, you know, what does it actually mean to them? What are they gonna try to say that they understood it to mean? supposed to be a meeting of the minds if it's a contract case, right? Uh, and so that would be, for, what are they gonna say at trial? What do most clients like? Do they like to go to trial most of the time? No? Well, turn. Well, why would anybody wanna be a litigator if you don't get to go to trial, if your clients don't want you to go to trial? What do they generally want to do with their litigation? So. Well, they really want to just want to get rid of it, right? And if they can get rid of it without settling, they would prefer that too, right? Uh, but I appreciate you chiming in. Yes, most, I mean, it's huge in commercial litigation, a huge proportion of cases settle before they get tried. Uh, in part because whatever you find out in a deposition might be something different from what people testify at trial. And then you've got one more uh, thing to deal with. Uh, uh, at the trial. So, but in my view, I, I don't, I always try a case or put a case together for trial while at the same time trying to figure out how to get testimony or evidence that I'm going to be able to whittle it down to the least bad case against my client or the most good case for my client. <clears throat> And a most good case could be uh, winning, if you're the plaintiff, winning summary judgment on liability. So all you have to do is prove damages. Or even better yet, winning summary judgment on liability and then only having to prove part of your damages because the other side admits to the rest of them. Uh, or uh, leaving to the jury uh, issues that they are entitled to decide on their own, such as maybe the amount of punitive damages, which would be fabulous if you get to that point and that's all you have to try if you want to get the actual damages resolved before trial. Uh, but uh, you also might want to have a situation where you, the other side knows that it's going to be toast, even if you can't win before trial. And uh, so they're going to want to fold or get into some sort of settlement posture so that they will, so they can get rid of the case and you can get rid of the case much earlier than you would otherwise. So uh, what are the basic grounds on which that you can end the case early other than a motion to dismiss, which presumably might even be before you produce all your documents? Procedurally? Procedurally, yes. Motion on the pleadings. Same. Okay, motion on the pleadings and summary judgment. Dismissal. 
uh, yes, you get somehow get dismissal, whether it be it voluntary uh, by the other side where they just capitulate or uh, somehow accomplishing it, such as what do we do in Quillian's kernels? Read the rule. Read the rules. And that, did one of our colleagues get a case uh, resolved by reading the rules this week where uh, they took advantage of a procedural rule relating to the payment of costs and got the case dismissed? Yes. So it had nothing to do with the merits of the case. It was a procedurally defective matter. So, and so obviously always uh, read the rules, figure out whether you can knock a case out on grounds totally unrelated to the merits, uh, which could be it. Uh, other and the merits would probably include a statute of limitations, but it might not include some sort of pleading failure by the other side, or uh, like I said, failing to pay costs. Let's say they they and they answered, but they answered late. They answered during the time they could have had a, a mandatory uh, setting aside of a default, but they failed to pay the costs. So uh, so therefore, the answer was not. Uh, properly timely filed so you can get a default judgment. Uh, but with respect to depositions, how could you use a deposition to get summary judgment, which is the place procedurally in litigation when you're where you're most likely to use a deposition to benefit your client before trial? Dan, what could, what could you get in a deposition that would help you Resolve your case prematurely before you go to trial. Um, well, from the plaintiff's side, for the liability purpose, establishing that there are no issues of material fact as to, uh, my, you know, my, if, you, if the deponent and the <coughs> admit to the breach of contract, and then on the defense side, um, well, if you're going to oppose it, um, summary judgment, establish there are issues of material fact or um, establish there are no issues of material fact. Aha, uh -huh. so you can one, eliminate genuine issues of material fact that would be tried. And one of the best ways to do that is to actually get an admission by the other side. So that would be a golden opportunity within deposition. If you can get the party opponent to admit, I ran the red light and smashed into the plaintiff, and you're the plaintiff, that would be a good thing. If you can get the party opponent to admit, I signed the note, I made the payments for X number of months, I stopped making the payments, I admit I owe the rest of the money, then that's going to help you out substantially. You might be able to get that admission in another way, and you might be able to prove it uh, without, uh, without having to take a deposition. But then you sometimes you're going to have issues floating around with respect to a note, for instance, like I mailed it, but, and I think, I don't know why you didn't receive it. <coughs> uh, my checkbook shows something different from your ledger. And maybe there's a gazillion transactions. And you can't get that straightened out. But if you can get the person to say they never made the payment, then you're in good shape. So you can get admissions. And you can also, if you are the plaintiff, and let's say it's a, a case that's anything but clear and you're never going to get to summary judgment on the plaintiff's side uh what can you get out of a defendant's opposing party or a, a non-party witness that would help you get to trial you can get some fact that they've testified to that's going to make it impossible for them to achieve summary judgment against you because the, the goal of every defense lawyer is to get summary judgment for the against the plaintiff i guess so so then you got to figure out how you're going to get to that point how are you going to get the person that you're deposing to actually testify to the facts that you would like for them to testify to uh in a way that <laughs> perhaps they don't even know they're making that testimony that's valuable for your case. And that's one of those discussions today. Uh, and it's very often not, what is your name? What is your title? Where do you work? Uh, if you just go mechanically into a deposition, 
and ask open-ended questions that they've already been fully prepared on by their by their lawyer and you just get rote answers uh, and and denials that's really not going to get you anywhere so you can start up you can start off the deposition thinking about maybe right out of the box don't ask what your name is the person's already shown up and everything you just say this is the deposition of so and so and then go immediately to a denial that, that that was in their answer that you know is wrong and he, and you know that the witness knows is wrong uh and read the the allegation and the answer and just say tell me why this could possibly be right they may actually reverse their the answer that their lawyer has filed for them why because a lot of lawyers don't even talk to their clients before they deny everything right uh so you've got to think about all right how am i going to arrange this thing so that i get to what i need it's not necessarily do i want to find out everything about this situation sometimes you just want to go straight for the throat get what you need and get out of there uh don't let the person uh give a long squirrely explanation that's going to somehow allow them to get them on so so let's say that you you know you've got your client story theoretically before you start the lawsuit theoretically you've done a reasonably deep dive with your client and you know what their their game plan is and you know what their story is uh, but then you start getting all the opposing sides documents and one thing you're almost always going to find is that your client conveniently forgot about a lot of things that they had done and said uh, or, or that at least raised questions about what your client is telling you about the case uh, and then you're also always going to have some mysteries that you can't solve uh, for because it all happened behind closed doors at the other at the other sides uh, business and so you have to start thinking about okay looking at these documents what i do have what likely happened between this event and this event that would be somehow rationally subject to explanation uh, that i can get somebody to testify to using what i do have uh, to cross-examine them with uh, and hopefully get the type of admission that i need and i, I did have one like that where uh it was a uh what happened allegedly happened in a boardroom uh where my clients actually were visitors to a board meeting at a bank and uh, they had the polar opposite story of what happened in the meeting from the people at the bank uh, <clears throat> and the bank said we never terminated this software agreement the client said they absolutely positively told us to terminate the software uh, agreement and to leave the premise it's no longer work so of course what do they do when they left the boardroom they called off all their people and they all left and then they got the default letter from the bank saying you took all your people and you left you're in default uh, and so uh, how are you going to get to the truth about what happened because you may have 10 people testifying we never said that we never offered we never told them to terminate the contract. We never told them to leave. You got two people or one person saying that's exactly what happened. Uh, any ideas of how you might go about trying to get to what actually happened? Using all the available tools that are in the new world of electronic communications. Well, you can look at everybody's emails surrounding these people and seeing what they were doing beforehand, what they were doing afterwards, uh, what they believed <laughs> happened. Uh, and I had this instance where there's two people that were not in the meeting, but they, I, they knew what was going to happen in the meeting. And they sent emails that were not clear. In fact, the email said one communicating to the other talking about the project manager of my client and they just said she was not as surprised as we had thought she would be and so what does that tell you if it says as she had we had thought she would be what do you know from that language i see vining's 
Austin's smiling back there. Sounds like they intended to disclose some information they thought they wouldn't know about beforehand. That's right. So these two people that were not in the meeting knew about something that they had thought about. <laughs> and they thought that somebody, the third party, our client's person, would have thought, uh, would have been surprised. Uh, so that means they had to have known something about what was going to happen before the meeting because this was only moments after the meeting, right? Uh, and they weren't in the meeting. So so that's uh, where I got the, one of the project managers on the other side with that email to say, yes, we had thought she would be surprised when they got terminated at the meeting, even though all the bosses in the boardroom were saying that never happened. Uh, things settled after that. But the point is, you have to go through the documents with a fine tooth comb, try to put yourself in the position of the people that are writing back and forth, et cetera, trying to figure out what happened in reality, and then trying to figure out how to get a witness who can provide admissible evidence to give rise to the facts that are necessary to defeat summary judgment or otherwise to prove your claim. So that actually gets to the point. To defeat summary judgment, can you just throw any document on the table and say, look, there's a document here. It says something different from what the other side is saying. No. No, okay. <laughs> but the, it has to be admissible evidence that would, it's gotta be the form of evidence that would be admissible at trial in order for them to be a genuine issue of material fact. So in that case, you have to have a document that's somehow authenticated. It can't just be, otherwise it's what? If it's an unauthenticated writing, nobody, uh, that's just, you just have in your possession, what would it be if you were at trial? Inadmissible. It'd be inadmissible hearsay. So in order to defeat summary judgment, you gotta get authentication of the document, which you can do in a variety of ways, including admissions at deposition, or it could be by a request for admissions or something. And you've got to have, uh, presumably, the, the recipient or the uh, writer, preferably the writer of the document, say what they intended to mean when they wrote that. Uh, and so you'll have actual testimony that would be admissible at trial to defeat summary judgment if you're the plaintiff. So with that, let's go into uh, what I was the real focus of this session, which is, okay, if you've got a thousand documents and you've got six hours to depose somebody who worked on something for four years, you know, how are you going to take that thousand documents and organize them in a way that you can, one, try to understand what happened yourself by looking at the documents? to get to the document that you actually need for the deposition uh, at the time you need it within the deposition. And then uh, three, figure out which ones at the end of the day uh, you actually wanna focus on and try to get rid of all the others if you can, because you can't keep in your mind very well the details of a thousand documents and all the things that might be shown in those documents, all the things that might be meant in those documents. Uh, and so what I came up with actually in the late eighties, that's a long time ago, the dawn of, uh, of uh, laptop computers uh, was uh, use of a spreadsheet <clears throat> to take documents that were already Bates labeled and to put them into a spreadsheet so that I could then uh, manipulate my, what I had put in to the documents regarding, I mean, into the spreadsheet regarding those documents. So I could help find my, what I'm looking for down the road and hopefully help uh, go ahead and designate the ones that aren't uh, particularly important, get rid of those or get them out of sight, out of mind. And then uh, use the ones that I think are gonna be most important. Most, and back then, you know, it was show it to your boss. <laughs> you had to be able to show it to your boss because, uh, used to just go someplace, get a box boxes of documents and go through them. And typically people would just put a sticker on them, say, you know, please produce these to us. And then there'd be a whole second 
run through of the documents that are now coming to you in a less organized fashion and typically they're produced to you. Uh, and I found at that time that if I'm off, if I'm out of town and I've got nothing to do but look at documents, I don't have people calling me on the phone all the time. I don't have, uh, you know, friends and paralegals coming to the office uh, asking me about this, that, and the other. That's maybe the best time for me to actually concentrate on getting in my mind everything I can about these documents. So I would take a laptop and just start and set it up a spreadsheet in a manner that was organized and just start plugging in information about those documents. Even if it took twice as long to designate the documents that I wanted to have copied, by the time I got back from St. Louis or wherever it was, I was looking at the documents, I would have a spreadsheet that already had my thoughts regarding which ones are important, which ones aren't important, which ones have some beautiful gem within them, which ones don't. And let's see if I can figure out how to launch a example. Okay. Okay, it did indeed launch. Love that. Uh, What I'm trying to do is look on the screen that I am as if I'm a not a presenter and uh, see how things look to y'all out there. Okay, so simple as it could be, and it's not anywhere near as complicated as a document management system uh, that you would use like relativity or something, which unfortunately means you can't have that much data in front of you at any given time. That's what I, we use them all the time, but the problem I found with document management systems is you generally look at one document at a time, you tag it with an issue, you tag it with the date, uh, you, you can attach notes to it, et cetera, but then trying to, get the flow of those documents in a, in a condensed place or manner uh, is very, very difficult. And so uh, what I learned was that software, uh, such as a spreadsheet software, uh, can allow you to manipulate. If you put in the documents, let's assume that you get Jane's documents and then Jim's documents and then Bill's documents and Tracy's documents and some subcontractors documents all coming to you uh, at different times and they're not necessarily in order. Some of them are produced to you in reverse chronological order. Some of them are produced to you in chronological order. That if you put the date into a, uh, of the document into a, a column in the software, in the spreadsheet, then you can sort the documents by date thereafter. And amazingly, once you get everybody's documents in there, uh, that's communicating with each, with, with each other, let's say, or who have a contracts so they are going back and forth or the, the, basically the, the situation is developing, then all of a sudden you can sort it by date and you can see, okay, now I know what happened because I can see in chronological order how all these things unfolded. And so if I was old fashioned and at a document production, I would take the documents, which hopefully have already been Bates labeled. This would be a real simple, I don't know if anybody can see this, uh, the column uh, that says Bates range, that'd be a real simple Bates number. This is one where let's say you have less than a thousand documents as opposed to a hundred thousand. And it's eliminated, although you can leave them in there, the uh, party name and the matter name. Uh, and then I would have another column that has the first page or alternatively the relevant page of that document because sometimes you have a document that's really huge, but it's only got one important page. Uh, it would have a date and a, you have to use either one and as far as I'm concerned, either one or two very regimented formats. It depends on which software program you're using. You either have to use this format, which I don't really like as much, which is, month, day, year, which miraculously uh, 
Excel recognizes as a date, or I like actually putting with no commas, no slashes, et cetera, uh, year, month, day. And I'll tell you why I like to do that. Now, unfortunately, I was having all sorts of internet problems this morning. I couldn't find an old sample spreadsheet. This is why I think that somebody else prepared for me and put the data in a different way. But this one will work because it's Excel. Uh, the great thing about year, month, day is that anything will sort it in that way. And that includes when you load it up onto a platform for taking uh, virtual depositions. If you put in your month day and you can call that document whatever you want to after that, which I usually put a really descriptive name, but not enough to give away to the other side everything I'm about trying to get in cross-examination, uh, then it will automatically put those in order for you, which means when you're in your deposition, if you're having to use a virtual platform, then if you just know the month or at least the range of days, you can find that document. Uh, rapidly uh, on a virtual platform launch. And then this, this example has to and from. You could also have CC, which could be really important. You know, make sure that you, you know, people that are CC'd are often just as important as the people that uh, are to and from. And then this would be a purely work product thing, the summary of importance. Uh, now that's weird. I don't know why that's showing up in the middle of that. Uh, of the spreadsheet. I don't know if I can move that around. This uh, this thing, let's see if I can move. No, this moves the document, not the. So I would have a summary of the importance and I would have something that tells me, since I'm the guy that's gonna be taking the deposition, what do I need to know about that document? Is there an admission in it? Can I ask a question forward or backwards or obliquely and get an omission, admission? Is it of a document of such importance that I need to designate? And what I often just to do it really efficiently, will put like four asterisks in the description. That way I know, and they're not gonna be very many documents that have four aster, asterisks, but I'll know that if I go through, if I go find and find in my spreadsheet and find all the four asterisks documents, and I've gotten the really key ones. So just whatever you know, whatever you can use to key in on the, on your description of the most important things. And remember, I'm sitting there thinking, this is the time I'm setting aside. I'm going to learn everything about this case. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm going to try to go through these documents, crank them into this spreadsheet, and then I'll have this as a go by for the rest of my whole case. And then also put an importance number, I would suggest one through five in another column. Five would be a document that's produced that you might want to have just in case, but the chances of you ever actually needing to use it as evidence is very, very slim. A one would be a document that really helps you figure out what the case is about. It may or may not actually be presented as evidence in the case but it's definitely one you wanna see in the future. And the reason why it's good to put this important thing, in it, and there's no reason to have more than five. If you have one through 10, you're never gonna be able to distinguish a six from a seven or a five from a four. Uh, but if you do sort by, let's see if we can get this, I gotta use this. This computer, if you sort by, See on the sort function right here? Assuming I can get it to work. I'm going to, have to turn it this way. Once again, let's see if I can get rid of this entirely. I'm probably just going to cut up, stop the share. Oh, boom. Okay. If you sort by, say it says sm smallest to largest or largest to smallest, then it will put all the ones in a row, uh, one after another. See now all the ones are at the top and all the fives are gonna be way down at the bottom. 
So now I've got all the most important documents at the top of my spreadsheet and I can spend some time going through and figuring out what I've already determined is most important. Uh, the other thing is uh, you can double sort. You can sort by one thing and then by another. Uh, so you could not only sort it by, and, and I, I didn't play with this enough with this particular spreadsheet, but you can sort by one, the importance, and then you can sort by dates as well. And then you can get, so you can end up with a chronological listing of your most important documents. I guess is one way of putting it by using this manipulation tool. And then that takes the other documents that you've looked at out of your view while well, they're at the bottom of the spreadsheet and you can still go use a search function and go find the document, uh, you know, using your, uh, any, any word that you can remember that you typed in regarding that document, any uh, comment, the date, you can search for a date, you can search to or from, you know, I wanna find, I know there was something from Jane Smith on this subject matter, but it wasn't that important. Maybe it just said, okay, or something, uh, but you can go search for that and find the document. So I like uh, using that because it just helps you uh, take a big pile of stuff. Uh, and hopefully, by the way, pictures or photographs, if you're really lucky, will be date, dated also. You know, somebody uses a digital camera that had dates. Or you can somehow get the dates using uh, extraction tools uh, from uh, a discovery provider. So, and then when you're in the deposition, if you, uh, and also this in a deposition outline, you can go directly to the Bates number and then you'll have, when you're preparing for your deposition outline, you'll know the page in the, in the uh, long range, this only has two, three document, three pages, but you'll know that it's the last page of the exhibit that's important, not the, not the first page. And you don't have to reread everything all over again to see the document you actually need to incorporate into your into your outline. Uh, let me see if I can scroll down here. I know it's a little strange to look backwards like this, but yeah, some of these you see that one's four seventy four to seven oh nine. That's how many pages it is that range. But page five ten is the one that's important. So. You don't want to have to be searching through in the future. Once you've already identified that one page that's got the critical information on it, you don't want to be having to look through the whole stupid, you know, 300 page document again, just to find that one page or that one sentence on that one page. So this helps you get uh, to where you need to be when you're ultimately uh, working up your, your case. And, and of course, all this folds all the way to trial. So it's well worth taking aside, setting aside the time and either doing it yourself or having somebody else do a uh, look through the documents. Now, what I would probably do is have uh, somebody else you know, give me the thousand most important documents and then do, let's say it's likely to be out of 10,000 and then I would work on the, that, that smaller set myself. A lot of people call those hot docs usually in an e-discovery review platform, they would be identified as hot docs. And then you would use, rely on other people to get you, you know, to percolate to the top, the very most important things, and then prepare some sort of uh, spreadsheet. Now, uh, I'm gonna stop share on that and say, how do I get to a, uh, how do I get to an outline that's usable? And, I'm lucky I'll be able to launch. Okay. By the way, I changed the names on. Let me get rid of this. I can. Okay. So basically, You've got to decide how am I how am I going to get to what I want to get to in a deposition? How am I going to find what I need to know and get what I have to have? Uh, 
And you always got to decide how, when to stop asking questions because you might have already gotten what you want. You don't want any uh, additional, want to, don't want to give the person any additional opportunity to squirrel out of the great answers you've already given. But also you're going to be expected to take uh, a case from A to Z and then uh, get to what you need. So uh, what I do is I use a spreadsheet for that. Why? Because you can put a lot more uh, information in a, uh, in a spreadsheet than you can on a Word document. And if you turn it uh, landscape, you can put a whole bunch more. And if you, how you put it on 11 by 17 paper, you can put a whole bunch much more. And you're sitting there in a deposition and, you're, and you've got a plan and you're going to want to go through using whatever starting point you've decided on, which is not necessarily day one and go day two, day three. It might be you start on day 56, go to day 100, come back to day one, uh, whatever the case may be. It depends on what you really need from this witness and how you're going to go about getting it. But uh, when you're laying out your questions, you can have a column, which is just a number. And all it is, is this is my number, question number one, two, three, four. You can put a reference date regarding when the subject matter came up that you're gonna be asking about, which is sortable and which and searchable. And it gives you a framework to ask the questions. Uh, and you also know if the witnesses talking about something and they've got the entirely wrong set of date ranges in their mind, which very often happens. Uh, you've got Bates numbers, SANS or without the extra uh, designators for uh, the client and everything, because you're usually gonna be use, usually gonna be using the opposing party's documents because they're the one, they have a harder time wiggling out. If they, if they produce the document to you, they have a harder time saying, well, I've never seen that before especially if they produced it to it, you and they wrote it. Uh, a description about what the subject matter is that you're trying to prove. And then here's the Bates range, this column F is uh, the Bates range. Uh, and that gives you what I consider to be, what would a mo normal person would consider to be a document. In other words, it's a contract, it's 10 pages long, it's pages one through 10, or, or, uh, or it's a letter and it's four pages long, or it's a letter with attachments and, it, and, and they all belong together. And so it's this set of, this set of pages. Uh, so the great thing about preparing a deposition this way, outline is you can go through and you realize, oh, darn, I, I forgot to, uh, I forgot to ask about that and I really need to cover uh, the subject matter. And so you can go to insert. This might be a little bit too manual for some people, but you just insert a sheet row and put in a new line. And then you put in a, let's say you don't want to renumber everything. So you just put in uh, 2.5 and, and then you put in whatever your question is. Now you can also do this at the very bottom of the spreadsheet and, and then uh, resort everything and all come out in the order you want it to be. So you can, uh, and you can, if you have 10 intermediary, I guess it's actually nine intermediary uh, questions, you can stick between two other questions you already thought of. That's plenty typically, but you can always put in 2.55 and still make it sort. <laughs> so in, a, in, a, in an orderly fashion. So if, uh, I, this was a, uh, if you had a deposition that's seven hours long and you know you're gonna use every second of that seven hours and you've got to get through a ridiculous amount of subject matter, you can uh, use this mechanism to start building your outline you can, and it's forever changeable. You can always go back and change it. You can proof it. You can send it to your client. You can get, uh, you can get uh, comments. They, so your co-counsel may say, don't forget about that. So you can go back and stick it in. Whereas if it's just a word document, my experience has been, it's just not nearly as flexible. 
and you don't have as many places you can stick information in that is ultimately achieve uh, that you can get. And you also, if you are at the deposition, let's say if you're old timey deposition in person, you're using paper, by the way, it's not so bad to do things the way we've done it for the last 50 years. You have a Bates number and your documents would be most likely in a box and they would have the Bates numbers on the file folder. And so wherever you are in the deposition, if somebody starts talking about something way down the road in your outline, you just scoot down your outline, cross-examine them on that, and you can just go directly to the Bates number and start pulling out the documents and cross-examining them on those documents. And so that helps you get to the documents you need uh, much more quickly than if you were, even if you have it in Bates number and, and, and date order, if you had all your documents in date order, well, if it's a thousand documents, you may end up having 50 documents on the same date, you know? So how are you going to get to your, uh, how are you going to get to your document in the middle of a deposition if it's, if you don't have the unique numbers? Uh, and Similarly, if it's on a uh, electronic platform, what I would always do is I would have the date and the, you know, with the year, month, day, a description of a document enough for me, but not to give away to the opponent if he happens to see the name of the document, what I'm about to get the cross-examination on. And then embedded in that would still be the Bates number, which is generally going to always be in there already electronically if it's been produced electronically too. That way you can search on your platform. Uh, you can search. I know there's a document. I know it's this Bates number. It could be one of, you know, 10,000 pre-marked exhibits in a, in a series of depositions. You just plug in the Bates number and it'll pull up that Bates number because it's in the name of the document. Uh, and then you can start cranking away, cross-examining person on, on that document. Uh, obviously you can use, uh, you can use uh, abbreviations for people's names. No, and sometimes that's really valuable. Uh, sometimes you wanna, if you got a lot of people that all have the same initials, <laughs> it doesn't help you a whole lot. So you might wanna come up with some other unique name for those people uh, so that you can crunch it down and make it more uh, compact as far as the, uh, the spreadsheet goes. Cause if you just have a whole lot of Jane Smiths, you know, it's, it doesn't help you a whole lot, but you can call them JS1, JS2, JS3 or, or whatever. Uh, so that is how I go about preparing for a deposition. And then uh, when it comes to actually taking it, it's a uh, trial and error. I mean, what you actually do might work great. What you actually do might not work at all uh, as far as how you attack, I'll call, I'll call it for the moment, attack the witness. Uh, that sometimes the witness, uh, will comply with your strategy and sometimes they don't. But if you have everything at your fingertips that allows you to be a little more nimble in, in establishing a, a different mechanism uh, for uh, getting the testimony. And I've actually found it to be really good to not ask the witness what they did do, but rather to say, to ask a question, a leading question, that's exactly what they didn't do. Uh, and they will turn around and say what they did do, which is exactly what you wanted them to testify to in the first place. It's sort of an example like that. Uh, rather than asking nobody else was there with you, right? You would ask them a whole bunch of, you know, X, Y, and Z were there in the room with you. No, it was just Jane. It wasn't those other two. You know, whatever the case may be, it's, it's funny that once you get a witness into a zone, I don't, by the way, I don't presume that everybody's going to tell the truth. How many of y'all presume that the witness is going to tell the truth? Charles? I assume the opposite. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so the way to get to the truth sometimes is asking something that's off the wall that takes the person off their game plan, and then they tell you the truth, and that's what you need in order to sometimes if you figured out what the truth is, you just need to get somebody to testify to it, then that can help you defeat summary judgment. 
but if you just ask them who was there, they're going to say nobody else was there, or I never sent an email or whatever, and and then you're going to be stuck with. Excuse me. I don't recall. Yeah, or I don't recall. <laughs> uh, but then in that instance, you you try to put if if a witness just says I don't recall, I don't recall. I, I think I actually said one in a not so distant deposition, something like you know what planet are have you been on, you know for the last five years you know somebody doesn't know anything they allegedly don't know anything about what they've done in their profession for the last the most important thing they've done you know for the last 10 years but there's probably a better way to ask that you know uh like you know did you have a car wreck on the way you know did you get run over by a dump truck yeah you know, what whatever some people just act be so stupid you know they they can't ultimately get away with it. Or if they do try to get away with it, they're gonna, what are you gonna have at trial when it comes to cross-examining? You're gonna have phenomenal cross-examination test oh, that you can just play their deposition where they're saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm a multimillionaire real estate developer, but I don't know nothing about anything. <laughs> and I've actually had that, you know, where they said, I, I didn't know how that million that million dollars got into my bank account. It just is there. I was informed it was there years later, you know, things like that. Uh, so that's what I was intending to cover today. Any follow-up questions before we sign off or thoughts? Better procedures? Yes. How do you prepare for incorporating metadata in in-person transition? Like for instance, with documents or emails, it, it has, you know, the category for last authored or last mm -hmm. modified, by, um, which can be useful in certain cases if somebody denies ever seeing a document or denies having created that document. So how do you use that electronic data in an in-person deposition? Okay, so I'm going to try to repeat the, an excellent question, which is, in your deposition questioning, how do you incorporate metadata that you've discovered hidden within a document during your document review uh, procedures such as last authored or the date last edited uh, where especially you're anticipating uh, the deponent will deny ever having touched or seen that document yet <laughs> maybe they're showing up as the last author or the last, last editor of the document uh, and I think what you have to do in that instance is get a version of the document that exposes that information uh, for purposes of cross-examination with the witness that you're trying to nail. Otherwise, you would have to have, and I'm literally open to comments on this, otherwise you'd have to have an expert come in and say, well, that person's clearly lying because they're the only ones that have the, the password to that computer. And this document was clearly edited on their computer on this day. Uh, anybody else got any, have you, have you ever used, uh, it used to, in, the, in the olden days, the really slick things were, okay, you had a fax that had a fax number at the top or a date, you know, that says the, the date the document was faxed, or you would find that the staples on a document were supposed to be at a, were at a 45 degree angle, but then they were at a, at a 180 degree angle. And so you could tell the documents have been unstapled and restapled or, 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 or whatever. I mean, that was, the, that was the equivalent of metadata back in the olden days. Uh, but has anybody used, and in which case, by the way, original documents were insanely important as opposed to uh, just ones that were photocopied and sent to you on, uh, over the internet. And that's still true. There are lots of instances where you might say, well, I want to see their original of this document because you'll find out they're highlighted, even though they're not highlighted in the version that, that you get. But anybody else on how to, how to use the metadata within a document? Uh, I'm thinking you can do, you can do screenshots of, a, of an opened document that's revealing the metadata, can't you? I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, so once you did that, uh, and, and let's say the witness continued and stuck with their guns, then you'd have to get a stipulation maybe from the other side that this document indeed has this metadata in it. And they would have to come up with some explanation for why the person, the only person that had the 
password to that computer never touched a document that uh, it, the computer says that they edit. Well, and couldn't it also give you grounds to uh, either depose or seek declarations, affidavits from other people that were contemporaneously involved in that? So, you know, kind of opens the door for other testimony to then yeah. you know, discredit this witness's uh, uh, lack of recollection for it. And I guess it, yeah, it obviously becomes easier if the document was edited and then emailed to somebody. But if it, it says, here's the edited document, but if it doesn't say that, if, if they edited it, printed it out, and then and let's say it's at a real estate closing and a set of documents was sent to the purchaser before the closing. And then it turns out that the person that was selling the property edited the document and changed something, you know, took the word not out or something, uh, uh, some significant change that nobody would actually notice in the documents and then came to the closing and had the person sign it. Yeah, you know, that would be that would reveal that they obviously had done something that, uh, or very likely had done something that was sleight of hand. Just trying to think of ways that would where they just change the document, print it out. They don't send it anywhere. It's the only we actually did that actually uh, just real quickly. We subpoenaed there was a a zoning change in the town of Tyrone, and. Uh, we had the Dickens of a time trying to identify exactly the zoning ordinance that was presented at a meeting uh, that was handed out at a meeting because our client didn't get a copy of it. And we subpoenaed the town attorney's computer that had all the dates of the documents, all the dates modified, et cetera. And we indeed were able to prove that only the town attorney had the last version of the it was the ordinance that was allegedly approved at the town council meeting, but the town council meeting was like a week before the that last edited document, which was the one that they ultimately posted on the website. So the so the town council never even voted on the zoning ordinance that they were saying was the final zoning ordinance, which was the one that was killing my client. So. <laughs> Was it a staff attorney or was it? A no, no, it was the, the town attorney, you know, and we, so we subpoenaed that we had, of course, a wrangle, a wrangle over attorney client privilege. I was like, well, how could a town attorney zoning ordinance documents be a privilege? You know, he's, he's preparing it for publication to the public for voting on by the town council, you know, but there was some pushback. I can't remember all the, yeah, maybe. I can't remember all the ways we accomplished that, but. It was a direct subpoena and we ultimately got it. And it was the computer, not the document itself, but it was the computer that revealed the date. Because my client was like, well, I was at that meeting and there's no way that ordinance said that at the time I was at the meeting. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was the sort of the scenario. But uh, so we can wrap this up. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for coming as always. Hope you have a wonderful week because I'm going on vacation <laughs> and uh, I expect spectacular deposition testimony by the end of the week. <laughs> I, I appreciate it.